For this lecture, we will cover chapter 14, the testing of donor blood. So in our last lecture, we talked about that little satellite bag that allowed the um, a little bit of blood to be drawn off of that donor unit without posing any sort of risk of contamination to that unit as well as to the donor. So you can see here in this image where you actually have that donor um, is being collected and you can see the blood flowing through the line. You can see the little clamp there where um, it'll, you can stop that flow, but you can also allow it to go into the little satellite bag and then you can see where that's clamped off and then this is going to go into the main red blood cell component bag. And then from the satellite bag, they're able to draw off those tubes that will be used for the testing. So there's several tubes that will be collected off of this little pouch and then those tubes are what will actually be tested. So donor testing itself can be divided into two categories. You have your immunohematologic, which is your ABO and weak D testing. So with donors, we do weak D testing on all donations if it's RH negative, and that's just to ensure that there are no RH antigens present for that D. Um, because we want to ensure that if we're given an RH negative individual, those red cell units that there's no sort of RH uh, fragment or anything antigen present on those cells that could potentially initiate the production of that anti-D. We're also looking for clinically significant red blood cell antibodies. So this would be like anti-D, anti-E, anti-Kale, Duffy, um, any of those that we, we have previously discussed, as well as we're looking for um, those infectious diseases. So those infectious diseases are things like hepatitis, HIV, um, HTLV, your human T lymphotropic virus, syphilis, um, that's your, um, your treponemals, your West Nile virus, as well as your trypanosomes or your looking for uh, Chagas disease. So of course, we're gonna figure out the blood type. We're gonna do forward and reverse testing as well as weak D testing on all of your negative donors. Antibody screen, um, and so with your antibody screen, you can actually do, um, you're looking for the antibodies that could be present in the plasma because you could potentially, if there's antibodies in that plasma product, you're not gonna infuse it or your, your plasma or your platelets because if you infused a bunch of antibodies to a patient that has that antigen, then you're going to potentially um, be causing some sort of reaction taking place there. So you want to avoid any sort of potential antibody. Uh, red blood cells can be used, but the antibody interpretation should be on the label. So the red blood cell itself, if the patient has an antibody, you can give them the red blood cells. There is very minimum, if any, plasma in that actual red cell unit, but you still would list it there just because um, you would list on the red cell unit itself, there is a place that you can put that information in. Um, so just like we can list if it's the unit is antigen negative, we can also list that the patient does have a particular antibody. So whenever possible, if I ever do have a donor unit that does have an antibody, I try to hold on it and kind of reserve it because Let's just say they have an anti-big uh, K. And if they have an anti-big K and they're making anti-big K, I know that their red cell antigens like that K antigen, which means I could give them to a recipient that has an anti-K themselves um, because I already know this unit's gonna be negative for anti-K. So that's the unit that I wanna give my recipient that has the K antibody as well. So having that information is useful. Now the um, immunoassay part of the testing or the donor um, testing process is basically looking for the various infectious disease processes that that donor could potentially have. So it's very important that the sensitivity and specificity is good um, for the testing that's done. So uh, making sure that the viral marking viral, viral marker testing um, is going to be actually optimal for detecting the presence of any sort of infectious disease that could be 
um, in that, that donor unit because we want to prevent that. Now, of course, in our lab math class, we did go over how to do these calculations for the sensitivity and specificity of a particular uh, test method just based off of um, the various results of known positives and negative of which one's true positives versus true negatives. And um, what that's going to do is just when we have that more sensitive and specific test method available for that testing, then it's going to help to ensure that we're giving a safe uh, blood component because of that viral marker screening test has been designed to have the highest possible sensitivity to be able to detect that um, any sort of infectious disease process within that donor. Now, testing is not always 100% sensitive, but we want it as pretty close to possible as that it can be just because we want to eliminate the risk of potentially giving an infected product to a, a patient or a recipient. So one of the methods that is used is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or EIA, which detects antigens or antibodies used in a solid object. So for example, a plastic bead that's coated with an antigen or an antibody, or it can actually be coated inside of that wheel. Now you have indirect um, EIA, which detects actual antibodies present in that sample. And then you have the sandwich EIA, which is actually gonna t detect the antigen being present um, in that sample. Now, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail because we have already discussed this multiple times in other courses, but basically you're introducing um, something into the sample depending on what you're looking for will depend on all of the other reactions that are actually uh, taking place as far as the antigens or antibodies, um, the particular reagents that you're using, the steps of the process that takes place, but ultimately what you're looking for is the presence of that antigen or that antibody in that sample that's directed against something specific. Another method used is chemiluminescence. And so with this process, it's basically looking for the emission of a light from some sort of chemical reaction that's taken place. And with this, what you're actually doing is the labels are attached to a specific antigen or antibody. Um, and so what you're looking for is that highest light intensity to actually be emitted. Now, um, again, I'm not going to kind of go into detail with this because we've gone into it in detail in other courses, but there are some advantages to this test method over some of the other test methods to include the sensitivity, stability, as well as the turnaround time. Nucleic acid testing or NAT testing will actually amplify nucleic acids of infectious disease and it identifies the viral RNA. So NAT testing can detect very low numbers of viral copies in the plasma way before the antibody appears. So it's very useful in being able to help catch the early state of the viral infection before the body actually has a time to completely respond and produce enough antibodies that are detectable um, within the plasma. And so with um, RNA and DNA viruses that we test for our blood products, it's going to include your HIV, HCV, West Nile virus, and um, Hep, Hep B. And um, another thing I want to mention is that there has been approval uh, several years ago to actually do multiplex assays for your NAT testing. And what that does is allow you to test for um, several of these uh, within pooled samples. So it could be testing several uh, of the NAT testing, looking for those virals on that one sample, or testing donor pools of like six to 16 donors. Um, so mixing those donor plasmas and doing that testing. So um, the only issue that I've ever seen with that is that when they do that, it does help to reduce waste of materials because you are doing that amplification. So if there's just a few copies present, then it's gonna amplify them. The problem is, um, that when you do that pool testing with those pooled donors and somebody's positive, you know, most of your population is going to be negative. If they know that they're donating, donating, they've usually not been exposed. So a lot of times, um, you know, you don't have any issues with it. But occasionally if one comes up positive, even if it's a false positive, then um, what will happen will be all of those donors that were in that pool will get flagged and so you basically have to hold that unit to the side until they 
take all of the donors that was in that pool and then test them individually. So it does hold up releasing that unit in a little bit more timely manner, um, but it does kind of reduce waste in the big picture of things. All right, so now moving on to our testing. So syphilis testing is performed, um, and of course that's looking for the treponema pallidum. And that can be done using the RPR screening. Um, most places have kind of gotten away from the RPR screening because there is a high rate of false positives. Or your hemagglutination, looking for that T or treponema pallidum. And with either of these uh, methods, if it is positive, then it does need to have some sort of confirmatory type of assay performed just because you do run the risk of um, some false positives there. And so you would do the confirmatory testing looking for that fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test. For our hepatitis testing, we, look in, we are looking for hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, as well as antibody to hepatitis B core antibody. We are also looking for an antibody to hepatitis C virus, as well as we do NAT testing to direct to, to be able to detect RNA for the hepatitis C virus, as well as the DNA for the hepatitis B virus. Human retrovirus. So a retrovirus actually contains reverse transcriptase, and what this does is it actually allows the virus to be able to convert the RNA to DNA, and then it will actually integrate that DNA into the cell. And so there are three subfamilies that exist, and more specifically, we're looking for um, HIV types one and two, as well as the he human T T cell lymphotrophic virus, or the HTLV types one, two, and type. Uh, five. Now, as previously discussed in other courses, uh, the HIV type 1 and 2 causes acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or otherwise known as AIDS. And what it does is it actually infects the CD4 positive T lymphocytes, or the, the helper T cells. And so our donor testing requires that we look for the antibody to HIV 1 and 2, which can develop 22 to 25, 25 days after an infection and also required to do um, NAT testing for HIV-1. Okay, so HTLV type 1 is associated with T-cell leukemia and type 2 is associated with a large granular lymphocytic leukemia. So all donors are required to be screened for antibodies to these types. So an actual transfusion um, transmission from a unit with this has over the years there's actually been evidence of various reports of individuals who developed um, a tropical spastic paraparesis of following transfusions with HTLV type 1 infected donors so um, and then you've also seen some reports of patients who have shown an atypical T cell variant of hair cell leukemia um, after transfusion with HTLV type 2. So um, making sure that you screen for these uh, is very important because we don't want to add any additional complications to, to the actual recipient. And of course, you would screen for some vector-borne uh, illnesses like West Nile virus. So this is uh, that mosquito type of virus where you have the clinical manifestations of a mouth fever, encephalitis, potential coma, and even death. And so donors are actually screened for West Nile virus using uh, the NAT testing. Additional testing will include the cytomegalovirus. Um, and so this is like a mononucleosis-like virus that is found within the white blood cells. And so you wanna make sure that CMD, CMV negative blood is actually given to infants or anyone who is immunocompromised. Um, so occasionally you might get special requests for CMV negative units. Chagas disease, of course, this is uh, caused by T. cruzi and transmitted by uh, what we refer to as the kissing bug. Blood collection facilities in areas with many Latino immigrants will perform an EIA type of testing for this. Um, in 2010, though, the, the FDA did recommend a one-time donor screening. So if the donor's never been screened, then you would screen them. And then if they're negative, unless there's anything in the questionnaire that indicates that uh, they need to be screened again. 
uh, they may not uh, potentially be screened an additional time. Bacterial contamination, of course, with our Aphorist products, uh, platelets or any kind of platelet product, because they are maintained at room temperature, you do have a higher risk of bacterial contamination or an organism being able to grow if it was introduced at any point during that collection process. So therefore, um, facilities must have a way to be able to screen those platelets before issuing those units to, to a donor, I mean to a recipient, um, just to ensure that that product is not contaminated and run the risk of uh, causing an infection. A look back investigation. So what this does, it actually involves the actions that you take when a donor test result comes back positive for hepatitis, HIV, HTLV, or West Nile virus. So you go through a process of actually quarantining any sort of product from prior donations that may still be available in your um, transfusion services. So like if you still have plasma products in the freezer, or if you still happen to have a red cell product on the shelf, um, then you would pull those and put them into quarantine. And of course, you would notify any facility that received any of the products from those donors, um, as well as test the donor um, even further if you need to, just to kind of confirm that there's no false positives. And of course, you would need to destroy or label, relabel that product, um, as well as notify any of the recipients that have received those products. So if you've got products that you have on your shelf and you confirm that they really are, um, they really do have one of these infectious diseases, then you would go through that process of making sure that you did that um, regulatory type of tracking on that product and putting it in that, that waste bin that's regulated and everything's tracked. Um, to make sure that you know where that product went, to make sure that you have documentation that it's destroyed. And if it was actually infused, there is a process that has to be gone through to actually um, alert that recipient and um, just to kind of do that follow up and make sure that anyone that received those products didn't, didn't have any sort of adverse event from that transfusion.